everyone and welcome to this Codens Community Webinar of, of February 2024. So today we are very thrilled to present an update on machine learning features in Codens. In this webinar, we'll discuss um, the machine learning features that Covidens has that help expedite the process of systematic reviews. And we'll also talk about other exciting features in the pipeline, either we are working on or exploring. I'm Rizzi Alyani, and uh, I'm a community manager at Covidens uh, based in Canada. And I'm going to be the session facilitator today along with my colleague, Julie Brown, who's also a community manager based in New Zealand. We are joined by our expert product managers, Alex Walton and Annalise Arno, who are both based in Australia. Some housekeeping before we begin. Uh, so today's session is being run on a standard webinar mode. All webinar attendees will be muted. You can ask questions at any time using the question box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, the session is recorded and you will receive the link to the um, to the recording within the 24 hours uh, via email. And here's the agenda of today's webinar. In a moment, we will um, hear some of our own machine learning and automation initiatives from Annalise and Alex, starting with RCT classifier and auto exclude non RCTs that we have recently implemented. We'll take a five minute pause to address your questions. Uh, following that, we'll highlight uh, the relevant sorting uh, feature demonstrating its capabilities to make your screening process more efficient. And before moving on to discuss the future machine learning developments that we are very excited about, uh, we will again take a short pause to address um, your questions. We will also be responding to questions throughout the session to the question um, in the question box. So keep your questions coming. And of course, at the end, we'll take any remaining questions that you have. Lastly, uh, we'll conclude with some final takeaways. Before we start, we want to hear from you. Uh, so let's kick things off with a quick poll to understand if you have used any of the Covidence existing machine learning features. So here I am now launching my launching the first poll and you should be able to see that on your screen. And I see the responses coming in. Um, thank you so much for that. And uh, um, please select all the features that apply. So um, it's not necessary that you have used one feature you might have used multiple features. So uh, please feel free to um, check all the boxes that apply to you. Your input is very valuable. And I see that's uh, about 80% of you have voted so far. Um, so I will just keep it open for a couple more seconds. All right, so I'm now closing the poll. So I see that um, most of you are not aware of these features. So I think uh, you're in the right place because in this webinar, we'll discuss about all those features. So hopefully that would be helpful for you. And uh, yeah, those of you who have used the feature relevancy sorting in title and asterisk screening is the most common. Um, thank you so much for your responses. And now I will hand over to Annalise to talk about um, our first uh, feature, which is RCT classifier and auto exclude non RCTs. Thanks so much, Rosia. Give me one moment and I will have our slides up. Yeah. I have just now made you the presenter. Great. Thanks so much for the intro, Rosia. So the first tool that we are going to go through is one that you may have seen other places or maybe you've even seen it in Covidence, um, but I understand that lots of the audience are here possibly to learn about new automation tools, so this will hopefully be an exciting first one to start us off. We're going to go through two sort of interrelated features. Um, 
but th there's multiple ways to use them. So we'll talk about that. So those are the RCT classifier and the auto exclusion or auto exclude non RCTs. So the RCT classifier or the randomized control trial classifier was developed by the Cochrane collaboration. Um, it is, I believe, available in some of Cochrane's own tools, and essentially we have integrated it into Covenants to use in various ways. The RCT classifier was extensively tested and trained, which is why it is sort of the first automation tool that we looked to uh, in order to integrate, start integrating automation into Covenants, because really at the top of our agenda when it comes to automation of any sort, is the complete and total safety of whatever tool we're choosing to use. It has to be rigorous. It has to be as good or better than what we're already doing. Otherwise, we consider really what's, what's the point because the, the whole purpose of our field and doing systematic reviews is to produce reliable evidence. So we're here to help you do that. The RCT classifier was trained on over 280,000 records. It is over 99.5% sensitive, meaning it is extremely, extremely unlikely to incorrectly exclude something. You're not going to miss uh, something that should have been included in your review by using this, essentially. Uh, I do have a link up to the classifier's sort of primary publication. So this is all available for you to look at and assess yourselves. The graph that's up on the right side of the screen um, is showing the classifier's predicted probability against the percentage of articles on the y-axis for RCTs in the sort of pinky red and RCTs in blue. So the take-home message that we want you to think about with this graph is that when it comes to the prediction of non-RCTs, it is extremely sensitive, uh, as opposed to there's a bit more of a spread when it comes to positive prediction of RCTs, which is how it's informed how we've implemented it, uh, which is to say that we're more about the exclusion of things that were very, very confident can be excluded rather than the positive inclusion of things that could have a bit more ambiguity to them, at least with the current model. So I mentioned that there's two different ways to use the RCT classifier in Covenants. Sorry, that skipped the slide. Uh, so option one is to tag your references, and I'm going to demo this in a moment. And option two is to tag and remove. You can set this up when you're creating a review, or you can set it up at any time after that as well. Of course, if you tag and remove, it will also be reported in your Prisma document, which again, I'm going to demo now. So I mentioned that you initially set up your RCC classifier when you're creating a review. So here's your create or start a new review screen in Covidence. You would name your review. We're probably pretty familiar with this. So the first thing to note about the RCT classifier is that it is only available for the systematic review type and the medical and health sciences area of research. The reason for this is that that's what the training data was with that uh, publication that we were speaking about just now. And again, we did not want to risk at all, uh, extending the use of this tool to anywhere where it hasn't been validated. So that is the reason that it is currently encouraged for these review types is to make sure that it's being used in the way that it's been tested and in, in the way that we're very confident and we can stand behind that it is uh, appropriate to use. So our two options here are either to tag the references or to tag and remove them. And if I click remove, then it's automatically going to check off tag. So if it's removed, it will be definitely be tagged, but if it's tagged, it doesn't necessarily have to be automatically removed. So I have a couple of reviews set up for us to have a look at this. So here we have a review that has nothing imported into it yet, no studies and screening, and I'm going to go ahead and import a file. So we will be going into option one, just tagging. So I will select my file for import. And then this goes through probably the process that you're pretty familiar with. It redirects you to the review summary page. And at that point, it will start sort of processing that file. 
what's going to happen is in addition to processing it for the detection of duplicates, it's also going to process it for the detection of RCTs. And then what it will do is tag those. Um, so it will have two possible tags, either non-RCT or possible RCT. Again, being very conservative and confident with the way in which this is implemented. So if I go into my title and abstract screening page, I'm going to see those tags against all of my imported studies. So I should. It seems to have not gone through in this one. Perhaps I didn't uh, take it off correctly, but not to worry because we have several other reviews that we're going to look at that will have this tag. So the second option is to tag and remove them. So I'm going to import that same file again. And here we'll see that it will not only tag those references, but it's actually going to automatically exclude the ones that are non-RCTs. because this might take a few minutes and I wanna make sure we keep to time. I have another review here that has already uh, implemented this. So here I'm going to show you this tag since I aired before and didn't have the tags ready for you. So here we can see a possible RCT tag. And for the ones that are not RCTs, I would see a non-RCT tag instead. If I want to review the things that have been auto marked as ineligible, I click this link up here. And if I just like with duplicates, if I think that anything was marked incorrectly, I can move it to screening. Uh, finally, as I mentioned before, it's really important that we report accurately what tools we've used, um, and in particular, the Prisma 2020 guidelines or the Prisma 2020 statement does include uh, that you should report anything that was removed by automation tools. So the Covenants Prisma does now automatically report that for you, and that includes if you have exported it to a Word document. So those are our two ways to use the RTC classifier. You can either just tag your references and use it as a way to inform your voting or perhaps um, bump things up in priority in the order that you want to vote. Um, or you can tag and remove and maybe cut out some of the work that your team has to do. Uh, so far, we've seen that up to 45% of studies can be, will be automatically removed by the RCT classifier. So that's a huge reduction of work. Of course, there is variance in that depending on your search strategy, the quality of the references you import. Uh, but I would certainly take anywhere between zero and 10%, let alone up to 45% is a pretty good showing. So with that, I will request for Razia to launch the next poll. So I've launched the next poll, which is if you have used um, auto exclude non RCT feature in Covidence, do you think it has made an impact on your review? And in this poll, you can respond any one of these. Um, either you think it has made an impact or no, or you're unsure. Um, and also, if you have used, you would love to know if you um, can share your experiences in the question box. We can. Um, I will give. A, I've seen. Okay, it's uh, eighty percent of you have voted. So I'll now close the poll and um, share the results. All right, so um, most of you have not used it yet. And those who have used it um, have responded that it has made an impact on your review. Um, thank you so much for your responses. And here we'll take a very short question. Uh, we'll take a short, um, we'll take a pause for question answer session. So if you've got any questions, please write them down in the question box and uh, we will pick some question to respond um, 
to respond to. So hi, Annalise. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. So um, one of the questions from William is, is there any chance that this will be available outside of the medical and health research area? Um, so when it comes to whether we want to extend this outside of the medical and health sciences, I think that really depends on if it can be as rigorously tested outside of that field um, as it was originally. Not only can it be as rigorously tested and validated, but also if it reaches that same threshold um, to which we held it in the medical and health sciences, meaning 99.5, if not higher, uh, sensitivity. Um, so in terms of any chance if it would, certainly we're not, we never rule anything out, but it always has to come back to that safety question of if we can very much validate that it is safe to use, then it could be something that could be examined in the future. Wonderful, thank you. Um, got another question here from Carrie, who's asked, um, so she's previously, or they've previously read um, that um, researchers should still review all the automatically removed records. Um, and is it recommended that this is done by at least two reviewers? I'm almost tempted to have uh, Rathia and Julie join us on this question, because I think that's a question for a, a methodology specialist. It, you know, if it were myself doing this review, I would probably review a, a random subset of those auto exclusions, but probably a pretty slim subset because it has been so rigorously validated in terms of um, inappropriate exclusions don't tend to happen very much. Um, but I think that that's a question for each review team, their methodologists, um, their risk appetite, not that there's much risk in this. Um, that would be my, my recommendation. Julian, Razia, do you have anything to add to that? Um, from my perspective, this is Julie, I think um, a random sample is, is perfectly adequate. I don't think that you need two people to, to check um, those automatic removals. Um, definitely a, a subsample or just one person very quickly going through and double checking that there, there aren't any errors there. That would be my recommendation. Mm -hmm. And I also agree to that. And the reason being um, in the Prisma, you might have seen that this is a step before screening. So you not necessarily have to screen everything, but of course you need to make sure. Um, just like you check duplicates, I would say um, it's really similar to that. Um, just uh, quickly check the random subset and uh, you should be fine. Okay, I think we'll have to move on um, based on the time, but thank you for all your questions and comments. And if we've got time at the end, then we'll come back to some of these questions again then. Um, so we'll just move on to the next section. Thank you, everyone. All right, so now I invite Alex to talk about relevancy sorting in screening. And uh, yeah, we see Alex is here. Hey everyone, hopefully everyone can see my screen as well. Uh, so first feature I want to kick off with is the relevancy sorting in screening. So uh, I saw in the, in the initial poll, we had quite a bit of use uh, of this feature, which is uh, really exciting. Um, but to kick us off, uh, we just wanted to ask people to put in the question box, uh, if you've used the relevancy sorting option in Covenants, do you think it's made an impact to the screening process? I've launched the poll and I see that 50% of you have already voted. I'll just wait a few more seconds for all of you to vote and before I close the poll and hand over to Alex again. All right, so I will now just close the poll as I see about 75% of you have voted on this. And here are the results. So um, half of you have not used it yet, but those who have used it, um, most, uh, most of the time it has made 
made an impact on your screening process. Thank you so much for your responses. And uh, I'll hand over to Alex again. Awesome. Uh, so talking a little bit more about the feature. Uh, so in Covenance, we have the ability to sort by most relevant um, in the title and abstract screening uh, stage. And really with this feature, um, we believe that it can really support teams in reducing the overall screening time uh, for uh, their title and abstract screening on their review, especially when the team has multiple uh, different people doing title and abstract screening and full text review. Uh, the feature of most relevant sorting is essentially bringing the, uh, uh, the references that we believe are potentially relevant to the top of the, the list so they can be screened first, um, allowing them to get into full text review sooner. So if they get into full text review sooner, it means that uh, full text review can start earlier and um, things can run a bit more in parallel for the teams that have people, um, different people working on the different stages. Uh, under the hood, uh, this is using an active learning model uh, that was developed by um, Epicenter, and we've worked really closely with James Thomas and Epicenter to bring this into the Covenants product. And how it works is it will predict the likelihood of uh, the inclusion of the remaining references based on your past screening decisions. So it will use the titles and abstracts of what you've screened and start to kind of build up uh, knowledge of what might be potentially relevant depending. Yeah, you know, according to that, and then the ranking will essentially work that way. Um, this is available to all reviews and is enabled by default. Uh, so it's essentially using the most relevant sort option in title and abstract screening, which I'll show soon. Jumping over to that, um, I have an example review uh, prepared. Um, and essentially, this example is showing a list that hasn't been sorted yet by active learning. And essentially, um, the references that I've imported here is essentially targeting a systematic review on the effect of vitamin C on the common cold. Um, so we can see in here, there is a mix of different uh, references, different topics in here, not specifically um, exactly what I'm, I'm looking for in this review. How the feature works is it will be um, sorted um, not by relevancy at the start um, while you start to do some screening decisions. So when it starts to kick in is uh, when you have either included or excluded uh, at least 25 references through the title and abstract. So you've included it into or you've moved it into full text review or you've excluded it at the title and abstract stage. And we need at least two references uh, from each of those categories. So at least two references have been included and at least two references have been excluded and a total of 25 references have been actioned um, for it to kick in. I prepared this earlier and went through the process. Um, and essentially what you'll see uh, when the feature kicks in is a message come up uh, off the sort option here, indicating that the most relevant sort is now using the machine learning to order the studies based on your include and exclude behavior. Uh, and if you wanted to learn more about it, we also provide a link out so you can uh, get more information around the feature. Uh, you can see in the list though, uh, we've now got quite a few uh, references that are more similar to the topic that I'm looking for. So we can see a very high trend in ones with the title of vitamin C and common cold, um, and that will kind of be ranked. So the, the ones at the top are the highest um, potential relevancy or likelihood to be included by me, um, going down to the lowest likelihood at the bottom. To ensure safety and uh, reducing the risk of bias in this feature, we have opted to not display any scores, ranking scores. Um, so it's all just a, a ranking system. So we don't, we're not showing any scores in the system. I will jump back to the presentation. Are there any questions about relevancy sorting? Hi Alex, thank you. So yes, we've had a, a couple of um, questions come through. Uh, first one I'm going to ask is, does relevancy feature automatically come on? It does, yeah. So after that 25 um, references have been either um, voted as yes and included into full text or um, excluded at the title abstract stage, 
it will automatically run the model and then re-rank once the model is complete. So there will be a little bit of time, a lag time in between you getting to that 25 mark and it actually re-ranking, um, but it will automatically come on. And when you start to add more references to the page, it will um, re-rank on those as well. I should also say that every 25 references that you either include or exclude, uh, they, it will re-rank. Uh, so it will be constantly kind of taking more of that context in from your screening behaviour and automatically re-ranking. Wonderful. I've also um, had a question from Gary that, uh, have you determined if there's a relatively safe cutoff threshold where you can stop reviewing the rest of the studies in your review? Uh, we haven't implemented anything uh, in terms of cutoffs at the moment. Uh, we are working closely with the community at the moment to explore cutoff rules, um, but essentially uh, we just want to make sure if we do implement anything from a stopping rule perspective or a cutoff rule perspective, um, it is done in a safe way and it, it will uh, essentially still maintain a quality of review. And, it, and at this stage, uh, we're still trying to build that confidence up um, to make sure that if we did implement something around stopping, um, it would we would be confident that it's it's safe to use and we're not uh, accidentally suggesting to exclude relevant references. Fantastic. And there are a couple of questions that kind of go um, hand in hand here, um, and it's about whether the relevancy sorting um, is is based only on one reviewer's decisions, or does it learn from more than one? Reviewers, do both screeners need to go through the 25 um, uh, references? Great question. Um, it is based on uh, the consensus. So uh, if you are doing a dual screener situation, we will need both screeners to go through the process and based on the consensus decision from that, um, we're then using that. So yeah, we would need for those situations, both of the the reviewers and screeners to actually go through and uh, complete that 25 on the same uh, references to be able to trigger that off. And that's really to remove that training off individual uh, side and actually training off multiple and, and using that consensus as a bit of a stronger signal. Uh, for a situation where it's a single screener review, um, it will just be based on that single screener. So it depends on the type of screening that you're doing, whether it's single or dual. Great, I'll just ask one more question in, in for this particular section. So do your relevance, uh, relevancy settings stay on when you go back into conf confidence after um, in subsequent settings or does it need to be redone in each session? Yeah, so uh, it will stay here. It's a default uh, in terms of the setting that you have in here. Um, it will remember that ranking from previous sessions. So if you go away for a couple of days and come back, it will still use that scoring to rank uh, accordingly. Um, if you wanna use other sort options, you can very much swap over. Um, but if you swap back to most relevant, it will revert back to using that, that ranked sort. So it will remember that across sessions. Fantastic. And as I said, if we have time to come back to some of these questions again at the end, Awesome, I will continue through. So the next section that we wanted to talk through was some of the future machine learning developments that we've been working on. So before I give a little bit of a sneak peek into a feature that we are currently working on uh, releasing, uh, I wanted to give a quick high level overview of where we're really exploring. Um, so from a covenants perspective, we operate at the moment uh, from title abstract screening all the way through to data extraction and quality assessment. And really the, the problem that we see here is that the time and effort required to complete a review is quite significant. And we are doing all of our efforts to try and reduce that effort and time in the screening, in the process, in the entire workflow, um, while maintaining quality review. Quality for, of a review is the utmost importance. We don't want to impact um, the accuracy or quality of the reviews that you're doing. Um, so we are looking at significantly reducing the time and effort it takes to complete a review, um, making sure that we're maintaining that high quality picture that um, is so important to, to teams. Uh, so where we've been focusing, um, a lot of the features you've seen already are in the screening uh, space, so title and abstract screening. 
Um, and that's really in progress and we're doing a lot of work there to, to bring new features out that are safe to use and will maintain that high quality while reducing the time um, to, to screen. Uh, where we're currently exploring and we've seen a lot of um, area for improvement around that data extraction and quality assessment space. And that's really where we're starting to investigate and see potential opportunities for, for automation or machine learning to, to be involved in that. Uh, we have done a lot of work and as you've probably seen in uh, our release notes, a lot of work in, in terms of improving the base data extraction um, product and we're really trying to expand on that with this and, and make it as efficient as possible. So to jump into a feature that we have coming very soon, um, which is the automatic removal of irrelevant references before screening. Uh, so it may sound very similar to the auto exclude of non-RCTs and that's because it is, uh, but we are essentially introducing a new model underneath this to exclude uh, irrelevant references. So what we are looking to introduce is a feature that will use the PICS inclusion criteria and I'll show it in a second in a demo um, to automatically remove a portion of irrelevant references before screening. So very similar to that auto exclude of non-RCT feature. We are working through calibrating this model to have over 99% of relevant references considered relevant by the model um, and that's a number that we've picked in terms of um, working with the community uh, to understand what the expectations are. Uh, for the performance of a model like this. Uh, so we are making sure that we are having that 99% recall in this. We, uh, when the feature does get released, um, there will also be a paper um, available on the evaluation of the model. So you can uh, see kind of what we've tested it on and our, our calibration um, to build a bit more trust in, in terms of the model. And this at the moment, uh, we'll, we are looking at rolling it out for medical and health science reviews only. Um, and it will be completely optional and disabled by default. And I'll show you in a second on how, uh, once it is live, uh, how you'll be able to enable it. So I will jump over to a quick prototype that we have. So noting that this is not uh, in Covenants at the moment. Uh, it is something that we are currently developing and working on. Um, and there will be release notes coming out when we do launch this into the product so you can try it out. So uh, similarly to the auto exclude of non-RCTs, uh, we have under the automation options section of when you're starting a new review, um, the ability to use the PICS relevant classifier to remove ineligible references before screening based on your eligibility criteria. And essentially this can be enabled here uh, when you are starting a new review uh, in the medical and health science space. If you are wanting to learn more about it, we will also have links out to help documentation as well that will provide further insight into the feature. This feature can be enabled um, exclusively or you can also enable it um, alongside the non-RCT feature as well if you wanted to use them together. So I'll create the review um, and when we come in here, the next step will be that you'll be importing your, your references. So that will come through an import. And you'll see uh, once they are imported, we don't have any auto markers ineligible yet. Uh, what this uh, requires is for teams to provide us with um, the inclusion criteria for your review. So if you go into settings, uh, there is a feature at the moment that's available for eligibility criteria, which is currently broken down by PICOs uh, with an other field at the bottom and also split by include and exclude. What the model will do is it will use the include uh, fields to, to base that uh, decision on uh, what you're looking for uh, in your review in terms of inclusion, and then we'll do the call, uh, trigger the exclusions based on, on that. Uh, so you'll be required to, to fill that in. Uh, and once you save it, it will start to run uh, the, the model in the background. So if we go back to the, the dashboard, we can see that we'll be working through auto detecting irrelevant references based on that criteria and it will automatically uh, mark references and as ineligible in the list. 
so once you jump in here, one thing that we've learned from everyone that is that double checking uh, is really important and being able to override um, decisions if you want to. Uh, so uh, we've built in this feature so you can actually view uh, what has been automatically uh, removed as well as being able to move it back to screening individually if you would like. The other key bit in here to note is that we also show the reason and this is really tying it back to that model. So if you do have multiple models running, so you've got the auto removal of non-RCTs and uh, this feature enabled, the, the reasons will show up here so you can see exactly what one has, has moved it here. And in terms of if the reference has been, is being considered irrelevant by both models, both models will appear, appear here. So you've got that, that insight as well. If you're not um, happy with the feature and you want to disable it, that is completely fine. Um, you can always come into the review settings here and disable the feature. And by disabling the feature here, it will move all of those references that have been automatically uh, removed prior to screening into uh, the screening process. So um, essentially removing that feature altogether. Um, so you can disable that. And that works the exact same for the Cochrane RCT classifier. So if you wanted to um, remove that feature and move everything out of auto excluded, or auto removed, then you can um, deselect the field here and, and hit save and it will, will cause that to happen. In terms of the references that it's automatically removing, uh, it will only automatically remove things that haven't had any screening behaviour on it already. So if the teams have already started uh, screening and you enable the feature through the review settings, it won't automatically remove anything that has uh, votes on it in the title and abstract stage. So your decisions will always uh, trump uh, these models in terms of um, you can, it won't try and override what you're doing from a manual screening perspective. And similarly to the auto exclude of non-RCT, this will show in Prisma uh, in terms of auto marked as ineligible. And that is the demo of the automatic removal of irrelevant references feature. So we had a question that we wanted to ask everyone, uh, which is where else in the systematic review process do you think automation might have an impact? And if you can use the question box for that. Thanks, Alex. So just while people are kind of popping in their, their comments and thoughts there, um, I'll ask you a few questions that have come through about the PIX um, classifier. Um, um, I guess a couple of people have just mentioned Again, is this just for medical and health sciences? Is it coming to other areas? You know, why isn't it available for other research areas? Yeah, we see the evaluation of the model being critical uh, in terms of any of these features that we're rolling out. And at the moment, um, we just don't have the data available to us uh, to be able to evaluate the model on non-medical. Um, space. So absolutely we have desires and interests in the future to, to roll this out more broadly outside of the medical and health science space. Um, but at this stage uh, we have set ourselves that bar in terms of being able to evaluate and provide um, that insight into it and make sure that these features are going to be safe to use. Um, and at this stage we can only really uh, do that in the medical and health science space. So absolutely in the future but at this stage we're rolling it out in the medical space because we have um, enough evaluation data available to get that confidence that it will be safe to use. Um, and once we have that confidence in the other, once we have that data um, required to build that confidence in other areas, we'll also be looking to roll it out more broadly. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question come through about, will there be any sort of score or an indicator of the model's confidence in a references exclusion? Um, we're not uh, going to be showing scores at the moment in the system. So uh, in terms of the scores that models will, will give back, it won't uh, provide too much insight in terms of um, whether it's a high or low confidence, but it is something that we would explore in terms of different features in the future to kind of indicate that. Um, so no, we're not going to be showing scores, um, but it's something that we'll be considering in terms of 
um, what is the requirement that people are, are looking to, to get out of, of being able to see the store and build features around that to, to actually solve that need. Great. And um, another really good question that's come through is, um, are you working with Cochrane to help establish if this is an acceptable methodology? So there's some concern that we might be adding um, features that then won't get through peer review um, with Cochrane. Yeah, so uh, we we are looking to work closely with Cochrane on this. Um, we have kind of been um, in talks with them around the auto removal of non-RCTs and that feature. Um, and this is one that we're also going to be um, yeah working oh, looking to work closely with Cochrane on as well. Fantastic. Um, one more question. So if you've got um, an incomplete PICO criteria, so maybe the eligibility criteria um, haven't been filled in um, or in all sections, is that an essential component of this feature? So do, does the eligibility criteria section have to be fully completed? Yeah, so uh, I will refer that back off to uh, at the end of the project where we'll be providing guidance uh, to teams when we do release the feature in terms of the requirements for the information you provide in terms of the completeness of the fields and even potentially how long uh, each of the bits of information is in each of the fields. Um, so that will come out in terms of documentation when we do release the feature. Uh, and that will be in line with how we've calibrated and evaluated the model uh, to make sure that um, we are only running it for situations that are consistent with how we've done the evaluation. Great. Um, and um, a very important question is, when will this feature be launched? I will say it's coming very soon. Uh, so we're actively in development at the moment. Uh, and we're expecting to have it coming uh, very, very shortly. Fantastic. Um, so in terms of the, the question that we've just asked, where else in the systematic review process do you think automation might have an impact? We've had some really good comments coming through. Um, so data extraction um, is a kind of common theme going on there. Um, possibly deduplication, data extraction again, um, automated meta-analysis would be great, um, automation being used for generating search terms or translating search terms, data extraction um, and meta-analysis again. Um, through again another one on um, data extraction again so this is sort of you know quite a popular theme that's coming through there so keep coming with all of your comments and thoughts about um, automation um, and I'll hand back over to you um, Razia Um, thank you, Julie. So, um, yes, we have um, just, uh, answered many questions in the chat box and also we have discussed a lot of questions. Um, if you have got more um, questions, please keep writing that and uh, we have our eye on the on those. Um, I see that um, generally I'm, I was just reading through the questions and I know that there is a lot of uh, concerns regarding the methodological um, uh, whether uh, like, for example, there were a lot of questions around um, RCT classifier that um, is there a consensus around this or um, whether or not um, um, uh, Cochrane has recommended it. Um, so I've answered a few questions, but uh, just to say that, uh, yeah, there is the methodological consensus on the acceptability of using RCT classifier. Um, 
I have shared the link of the article that Annalise presented. So uh, please have a, have a read through that article and uh, that is very much detailed on um, how it reached the 99% recall and uh, reduced the workload basically. So um, for example, in this article, you'll see that um, during the 2018 year, um, classifier saved uh, Cochrane cr crowd from needing to uh, manually check around 185,000 records, uh, which highlights its uh, practic practical utility and also the methodological consensus around its use in the systematic review process. Uh, and uh, all the features that we will um, uh, that we will release, uh, we will make sure that we uh, uh, that we rigorously test those uh, features before we release them. Uh, we do receive a lot of uh, queries regarding uh, uh, when will we launch more features. But the reason that we are taking some time in launching those features is because we really want to make sure uh, that. The, the features that we launch are uh, rig rigorously tested and uh, we uh, also publish the metrics uh, to make sure that they work well. Um, Julie, do you see any more questions? Because we have got 10 minutes. So um, if we have more questions, we can maybe try to answer those. Yep, just going through them now. So there's um, there's a question that it's kind of not what we've openly discussed here, but it's a question about deduplication. And we've had a couple of um, comments about um, deduplication and how that's done within um, confidence. So do, do, does anyone on the line have any thoughts, Alex or Annalise, about um, how the current deduplication process might work in relation to automation. I'm happy to comment on it. Uh, so at the moment, our deduplication process, um, yeah, is we do have automation in deduplication. We are automatically deduplicating. Um, very much a rule-based system at the moment. And um, I see there's a lot of comments in there in terms of improving deduplication. It's absolutely a potential uh, space that we could improve. Great. There's also a lot of comments um, about the use of um, automation in search strategies. So that isn't something that Confidence is um, currently involved in. You have to create your search strategy outside of our platform at the moment, but there's a lot of interest in using automation to help with that. Um, Just a That's comment it. on the sorry. No, no, carry um, on. Just, just a comment on search strategy automation. Um, if you've used systematic review experience, you'll see a lot of uh, good features that really help with the search. So, um, for example, to search translation to see the sensitivity and specificity of search based on some of the preliminary search. So do check that out. Um, and also based on your preliminary uh, preliminary search, it will extract the keywords and the mesh terms for you. So there is already some work that has been going on um, in this space. So yeah, keep an eye on that. Yeah, we've also got a question about, um, I guess, the way that the RCT classifier determines whether something is an RCT or not, and what what does the term possible RCT and why use that that phrase? I can speak to that if you like. Um, I also have seen a few questions come through in the chat about how it is that Covenants is looking to determine if something's an RCT or not. Um, so I'd highly recommend checking out the publications that we've linked because they get into sort of the, the nitty gritty technical details of that. Um, and the short version of that answer is that we are using this externally validated system um, in order to inform our tags in terms of non-RCT and possible RCT. Um, in terms of why we've gone with possible RCT rather than definitely an RCT, it goes back to that graph, if you recall, where we saw that the sort of 
prediction accuracy for a non-RCT was extremely, extremely high. Um, so that sort of red bar that was on the left, as opposed to the positive prediction value for RCTs, which um, varied a little bit in terms of that score. So we can be extremely confident in saying these things are not RCTs, and that's why we have designed the tool to, or the feature, to exclude those rather than flipping it the other way around and positively um, including RCTs is to make sure that it's maintaining that high confidence and high accuracy. Um, so that's why we've gone with the term possible RCT, because we can say it may or may not be an RCT or are the things that have ended up in that category, whereas the things that are marked as a non-RCT, we are highly confident are not randomized control trials. Hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Annalise. Um, another question is, uh, is there any plan to develop a classifier for diagnostic um, test accuracy studies? I can touch on that. It, we don't have anything at the moment in our pipeline uh, for classifiers in that space, but uh, yeah, very keen to hear in the questions of um, yeah, a little bit more information around the, the benefits of that and um, if you have any further insight into that idea, because yeah, we're, we're always keen to hear um, potential improvements that we can make in that space. Um, fantastic. Another question is, um, since the RCT classifier was trained on the uh, Embase database, um, have you tested it on other databases? Um, so the, the question also asks about whether the tool is effective for grey literature resources as well. I'm not sure I can speak to its effectiveness in terms of grey literature. Um, in terms of other databases, so I, th I think what this question is getting at is that the central records, which are the records that were informed, uh, used to validate the RCT classifier, were based on an M-based search. Um, so would it apply to other records? My answer to that would be it depends on the quality of the records that are exported, essentially. So if there's a well... Um, if the title is properly populated, the title field of your citation file and the abstract field of your citation file are populated to the same quality that an Embase search would be, then I would be very confident that the RCT classifier is going to act to that same standard, um, as opposed to if you get sort of a truncated title or a completely missing abstract, then it might not be as confident. The good news there is that if the tool isn't as confident, then it is not going to apply that label and exclude it for you. It's only going to do that if it can very positively say, yes, this um, is a non-RCT and can confidently exclude it. Thank you very much, Annalise. Um, I think we've just got a few minutes left. So um, I think we've just got a, another slide to show you how to contact us. Um, and where to find out more information. Okay, so if you want to sign up to Covidence, you can use one of the links here and um, sign in if you already have an account. Definitely check out our knowledge base. It's got lots and lots of really useful information and guidance um, on all different sections of the review platform. And um, there's more information there about upcoming webinars that you might be interested in attending. And again, if you have any comments, we'd love to hear about them. We want to hear what new features you want. Um, and we'd love to hear about how your experiences um, with the Covidence platform are. And you can do that by contacting, contacting us at the support team. So support at covidence.org. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we obviously may not have dealt with all of the questions um, today, so we will endeavour to respond to, to people um, after this um, webinar as well. Um, and as we mentioned at the beginning, the webinar is recorded, so you'll be receiving um, a link within the next 24 hours to be able to download and review um, the webinar itself.
Yep, so that's just the link to, if you go to our knowledge base, you'll be able to view any previous recordings of webinars and our step-by-step -step series in showing you how to do various different sections. So how to getting set up with Covidence, we'll show you how to import those references um, and screening or go through some of the relevancy and um, features that have been discussed here as well. So you can watch previous recordings there. Okay, and I, Razia, I'll just let you finish up um, the meeting. <laughs> Thank you so much for attending the webinar and uh, asking such great questions. Um, I'm still looking at the questions and hopefully um, I'll respond. Uh, we'll try to respond uh, more questions that we couldn't uh, answer. And I, um, we actually really loved all the feedback that you have given in terms of um, where you think that um, AI can help with the systematic review automation. Some of the um, comments, some of the ideas, these are very, very um, useful. And uh, you will see um, in future, there will be a lot of implementation around those ideas. So yeah, thank you so much for uh, your active participation and attending this webinar. Um, do let us know if you have got any more questions. Uh, we are happy to respond to you. Um, you can email us at, the, at support at the rate and we are a team that are working around the clock, so um, we aim to respond very promptly. Thank you so much. And now I'll end the webinar. And thanks a lot, all the speakers, Annalise, Alex, and Julie, for answering, uh, taking a lot of questions, answering them.